co-founded with a company called Alpha. We're a B2B marketplace and we connect companies to visual art. Uh, we self-produce limited edition prints uh, globally and in, through a network of suppliers. So it's a way for us to import and export art anywhere in the world without having to deal with that hassle of logistics, cross-border taxation, so many of the issues that come along. But one of the most important things for us is certification. From day one, we were very concerned on how it is that we can maintain authenticity in these prints, how it is that we can track provenance. So one of the things that we're doing now is we're actually uh, migrating a certification, which is generated automatically by our CMS. So it's already kind of a ledger, it's just not shared. Uh, into individual artist utility tokens. So the idea is that the prints, which are priced via scarcity, will actually serve as a thermometer for the artist to be able to price all of his artwork. So the utility tokens uh, will act as a catalog of in life, where the artist can actually upload all of his imagery of the works that he's sold in the past, and where our digital certificates will plug in uh, these are prints that have been sold through the platform, open, transparent, and pricing is the same. I would love it if the panel could give a brief intro on what it is that they're doing, the blockchain, pain points. I think we, we might start with Leo. Uh, I read up on uh, your business and it sounds really, really amazing, mind-blowing. So I'll let you take it from here. Oh, apparently not. <laughs> uh, so uh, maybe you want to start? Sure, yeah. Uh, how's it going, everybody? Uh, my name is John Crane. I'm the CEO and co-founder of SuperAir. Uh, SuperAir is what we like to call a, social, a creative social economy. Um, so it's sort of like a social network um, and community of artists and collectors uh, who issue one-of-a-kind uh, pieces of digital art. Um, they are, so the piece of art itself is a blockchain token um, and people can collect these, they can trade them on the marketplace and the platform. Um, and yeah, uh, it's, on, it's built on top of Ethereum, so if people have any Ethereum questions, feel free to direct them my way. Hi, I'm Patrick Martin, a digital artist and making work about technology and consciousness. And uh, I think I'm mostly interested in, in blockchain as a kind of a hypothetical uh, idea um, and uh, bridging over from the sort of existing art world, um, which is pretty bereft of understanding of technology in general and kind of willfully um, resistant to it to some extent um, and has already kind of a hypothetical economy that floats on a different layer of, of trust. So it's actually really similar, but in the uh, in, in the new instance of, of sort of blockchain uh, companies, there's a it, it's almost like a parallel art world uh, of, of people who, who may be coming from other professions into art, um, and uh, at the same time, there's you know there are all these kind of concentric circles and non-overlapping circles. And uh, so I think that's a very interesting space to see how these things are interacting and, and, and bridging from being high tech, but maybe uh, less high concept, and or being very high concept or very low tech. And I think there's a lot of uh, interesting room in there for growth. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is, uh, first of all, Leo, can you hear us? Are you a part of us now? Or are you gonna hang up soon? Leo, can you hear us? He wrote hey, you were talking to me. Can you hear me? Yeah, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, yeah. You sound a little echoey, so I'm having trouble hearing you. Uh, but I'm coming. Yeah, my name is Leo Madrid. I'm uh, based in San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, I've been in the arts for about 20 years, uh, off and on in various capacities, including I was a gallery director in Union Square, San Francisco. I placed about 400 individual works of art in private collections, valued at over $5 million. And uh, for the last couple of years, I've been doing conceptual art installation work at art and science festivals. And I'm about ready to launch a large 
online marketplace for artists that would potentially have uh, 10,000 plus artists online. Um, my name is Monica Prophet. I actually have worked with two of these people, so uh, Patrick Meager as well as Leo Madrid. We've done a couple of small um, innovations together. We're always sort of cooking up different things. But um, my background is in uh, serving artists. I started an artist retreat and residency center um, about nine years ago, eight, eight or nine years ago. I ran it for a while and eventually grew into a global exhibitions program where we went, took emerging artists to places where they wouldn't otherwise get in like Art Basel Miami, Venice Biennale, um, Freeze New York, on and on. And one of those connections is actually who referred me here. So the world keeps getting smaller, even in a giant city like New York. Um, I also started an online digital course to teach artists the business of art, so they can um, hopefully start to manage their themselves in a way that they would be profitable and be able to make a living and a life. So then I also did a publication, an annual publication, which we'll be starting again uh, soon. It was down for the last year. It was called Artists to Look Out For. We have an open call for artists. They can apply with their work, and we pick about 100 each year and do a publication to help give them something, a, a truly printed um, catalog of what we think are the most promising up-and-coming artists of that particular year that we, that we see on the circuit of art fairs as well as with digital um, digital classes. So that was my last company. I just sold it to another woman who's taking it over and I'm going to be helping her restart, say, the digital audit program and that, that stuff. So that will continue on. But uh, I sold it because I wanted to move into working with a larger demographic than just the creative class. I realized that I loved solving problems and having a robust financial aid program, for example, to help artists that were struggling get into places where they would hopefully be able to leverage and you know, leap, leapfrog in their career. But I also saw that a lot of people were you know, struggling financially and it's not because they chose to be artists, it's because they just didn't have a lot of other opportunities. So I wanted to serve more folks that were struggling more ways. And for me, that became choosing real estate because it was the most common vertical that everybody pretty much engages one way or another. So in securitizing real estate using blockchain, I'm also just, it's been the first vertical of many. So I think securitizing in general is what we can do with blockchain is enormously important. And looking at larger socioeconomic ways that we organize ourselves around our goods and services and resources as human beings now has a new metaphor with blockchain. So when we talk about tokenizing, we now have a new way to maybe open up the conversation which has been before been about securities and stocks and big businesses. And now anybody can securitize something very small. But then fractional ownership can also bring a collectivism into something that's capitalistic. And then a utility coin can hopefully bring in a sense of membership and activity and, and coupon and um, all these other things that we never really connected with what could be truly a currency, a you know, national currency that we engage. So now I'm really interested in these intersections geopolitically and sociologically that get manifested through this new layer of blockchain technology. So I guess I'm still kind of an artist in that sense, um, having fun painting in broad strokes, and in the meanwhile, hopefully helping more working people get access to a really good investment like real estate through securitization. Oh, and I wrote a book, Blockchain 101. It's small, it's supposed to be unintimidating. If you want to buy a copy, there's 10 bucks. I'll send you on that. Thanks. Well, thank you for that. Um, so I think one of the most important questions when you're thinking of arts and blockchain is how do you define digital scarcity? Uh, so I'd love it if you guys could, you know, take a, a jump at it. Uh, Patrick, as an artist, I would love your point of view. Um, you know, it's funny when, when in the kind of the first rodeo around blockchain, people were still talking about like the idea that you could have a, a ubiquity models that would function, right? yeah. and that um, before the web got so swamped that just, uh, just became kind of a, well, what it is right now, but uh, kind of a mess, right? Uh, a glorious mess. But yeah. Um, the, uh, the yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's the direct parallel from from print thinking, and um, uh, at, at the same time, uh, there. The art world that is being promulgated in universities is, is, is more oriented towards uh, social practice kind of activities and things that are away from, from objecthood. So, so there's an interesting thing that, that we're focusing on objecthood at the same time where uh, universities are, are pushing practice towards you know, uh, a material kind of uh, labor 
and uh, interactivity. So, um, so the, 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 that's something I'm, like, I'm trying to help with bridge because, because the idea of like of having a tokenized or rare digital objects um, can totally match up with that because uh, it, and instead of just being around products or things like. Someone can put their project out there in a kind of Kickstarter way, but um, but 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 generate real more more community around that project. Uh, sorry, it's something I'm talking in circles sometimes. Uh, yeah, and just to, to clarify, digital scarcity is just you know the concept that something can be digital but still be limited. Uh, so I think you guys do a great job with it on uh, how you price an ether, etc. Yeah, I like to think about digital scarcity as just like the ability to create like a digital artifact. So it's sort of, it can be anything. Um, it's, uh, you know, the internet's really good for sharing things, the prolifer proliferation of objects as we've seen, you know, with like torrenting movies and different things. Um, so it's kind of, it's an interesting place, you know, for artists in general. I think it's been a little bit of a blessing and a curse, the ability to share and have things spread around. Um, but as far as, you know, making a livelihood, paying rent, uh, this can be difficult if everybody has, you know, a creation of yours. So, uh, digital scarcity is sort of a tool to create one unique artifact that, um, you can claim is sort of the original and that's where, uh, value can accrue. Perfect. Do you have anything to add, Monica? Well, I think, um, ooh, shit, new microphone, new relationship. <laughs> um, I think, uh, you guys kind of touched on two different things. One was something that really could be captured in this securitization model, where we take an object, we limit it or, or intentionally, or we only can find so much of it, such as like, well, I guess the commodity of gold or something, but we have a certain limited amount so far, and that therefore is a big driving factor in this supply and demand relationship of value creation. And we track that and we do things so if we create, a, say, a, a limited number of, of prints or a limited number of something in the art world that we've, we've been trying, we're trying to use that model to push up um, value. But there's an interesting new model that's come up with the invention of the internet, and I think that Patrick sort of touched on it a bit. At least that's what I heard was, uh, and the utility coin might may be one way that we can harness the value that's made there. And that's actually the exact opposite. In the in removal completely of, of anything that makes it rare and scarce. So you know now people upload things to YouTube and it only has value if lots of people have used it, right? And if you can make a model where I mean if you if you try to limit something that someone's going to look at or listen to like music or art, you may actually be intentionally devaluing it, right? Because uh, like Spotify has proven, it only really works if lots and lots of people are part of it. Now the unfortunate part of Spotify is that it's not helping the individuals who created it. But YouTube has maybe been a better example of being able to be a platform that enables people that are creators to also uh, engage in a way that they can be rewarded, not for their scarcity models, but for their abundance models. So it's interesting, the idea of like scarcity versus viral. And I think one is, is uh, collapsed up into the security model, and the other is kind of used a lot in the utility token model. Yeah, I think there's a, a different concept there of separating ownership to viewership which could be explored, especially museums and you know, massive art collections. If you were to tokenize masterpieces and uh, make viewership free, but ownership could be quantified in a way uh, due to numbers of viewership, that's a different metric that we could explore as well for the future. Yeah, there are lots of ways to create value, I think, in, in art, especially in trying to engage culture and utilize you know, consumption of art as, as, your, as your driver of value. Perfect. So I think a lot of people are, have uh, an essential question on how do you actually wait to read? What about Leo? Leo, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you a little bit. I Perfect. like every other every fifth word I can make out. <laughs> so do you want to try and tackle uh, what's your definition of digital scarcity? Uh, on scarcity, great. So scarcity really falls in line with a uh, big issue in the art business and that is uh, provenance and tirage, in particular tirage. Uh, the same issue in fine prints exists in uh, the digital realm and that is how many are in the actual edition size. And uh, I think in uh, digital scarcity and with blockchain what we'll be able to do is give confidence in the buyers because that's for, for my role you know, uh, I plan on using blockchain to remove barriers to acquisition, streamline delivery, and build collections. So 
digital scarcity or just the scarcity in general with a really strong tirage uh, management and really explaining pe to people exactly what that is and where that place will give them the confidence to make decisions much easier. And uh, so I think what we'll see in the future is really a blending of digital uh, scarcity and real world scarcity, Perfect. Yeah, combining them both. Uh, Leo, I have a follow up question. How do you, do you integrate blockchain on your distribution? Be it on limited prints or be it on unique pieces? Uh, is it via IoT or is it via certification? What do you think is the best path there? Uh, I, I, all I heard was how do you, I didn't, I didn't really get that. So, how do you integrate blockchain into your distribution model? Do you do that via certification, which as a standalone or as IoT plugged into a physical piece? How do you bridge that gap between the physical and the digital world? Well, I would think that uh, what we plan on doing is having, uh, even for uh, real world works of art or digital works of art, a separate digital certificate, basically a certificate of authenticity that will follow that piece wherever and be connected to any exhibitions so, for example, if somebody has an image and there's 150 of them uh, and that image is exhibited somewhere in the UK and the collector has an image in, uh, he's never been to the UK, he doesn't even know about the show, that, that exhibit will still be associated with that image, that that image is shown. And uh, so, I, I, did that answer your question at all? Yeah, no, I think it's... Don't use the mic, and use, you have to talk there because he's getting an echo. I don't have that much of a voice, so you guys might, might not hear me. Yeah. Well, you can stand up and just ask him. Uh, so, and that was actually going to be for the entire panel. Sorry. But, okay. not uh, so, uh, my, my, my comment, more than a question, is that, you know, it's the biggest channel is really on what happens if you lose a certificate, if you have to have some sort of IoT alongside a piece. It's a question that we get all the time when we're developing our certification. So I was actually going to switch to you guys and see, you know, uh, where, where does that fit in on the process? Yeah, so for us, uh, the piece of art is also the digital certificate, uh, since it's a token, so it's nice. We just can sort of get that for free. Yeah. I think you can take that model and, and just keep scaling up the ladder. I mean, printmaking was always sort of the entry level into fine art collecting. It's, you know, prints in general just are considered almost like a second class of, of, of art on some level, which is just kind of unfair. It's, it's, it's a weird thing that's related to publishing. Uh, and there's certain conceits around that um, that are uh, you know, both useful and problematic. But, um, but I think the idea that that, that art always was, was pushing was, 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 the, was the notion of stewardship beyond, beyond collecting and beyond the idea that something is um, you know, a fungible object or an investment. Uh, so I, I think we should encourage tokenization for, for different types of projects uh, that um, allow long-term uh, value. If you think of conceptual artists like Guido Conchi or, or Chris Burden, um, or, or the newer artists who, who use systems of, of, uh, of enumerating their projects, there are other ways of, of uh, kind of bringing that, that story uh, in, in, into work without it necessarily having to be a, a you know, trainable object. So, um, because we're, we're, we're going virtual and we're also going into, into interactive space with, uh, with, with projects that start to look a little bit like social services. But, it's, uh, you know, art's always being weird, right? That's what it is. Art is social services, I like that. I was a social worker for six years with chronically mentally ill homeless people, which I have to say was the most like applied theater and improv that I've ever had in my life. It's like, yes, and with a purpose. But anyway, yes. So I'm mentally ill, so I mean, homeless is kind of art. You know? No, really, I mean, arts administration was not a leap after that at all. Anyway, I'll stop there. <laughs> Uh, so John, you price your your works on the platform on Ether, right? And uh, well, you know, with everything that has been going on with crypto and volatility, how does that affect the sense of value for the artwork versus the sense of value for the coin itself? Yeah, sure. So um, 
Yeah, we launched in April kind of like the first version of the marketplace, so everything happens with Ether and kind of just goes through the smart contract. Um, I think in general, sort of the price of the pieces has just been going up with Ether, so you know, something that would have been maybe a couple of Ether in April is now, you know, maybe five Ether or something like this. Um, but it is definitely an issue, and so one of the things we're focused on we're gonna launch um, early next year is integrating a stable coin, and for people who are unfamiliar with this, uh, this is just a token that's pegged to a value. So uh, we're going to be using the Dai stablecoin. It's uh, one of the tokens on Ethereum. Um, I think it's pretty, you know, it's interesting. It's a, it's a decentralized stablecoin as opposed to like an IOU token that some of these other ones are. Um, but that's sort of the way we're approaching it because I think it is an issue. Yeah. What is it pegged to? Uh, so right now, uh, Dai is pegged to the dollar. So one. Die yeah, is a dollar. It's one dollar. Yeah, exactly. Perfect. Yeah. So there's some kind of maybe joke in there with, with like the uh, the meltdown value of the sculpture, like when it, um, when there are all these uh, communist questioning statues that were made out of bronze, and all of a sudden the, the social value kind of dropped to zero. Um, people were like, yeah, we should melt that down and make some you know a bowl or something. <laughs> so, you know, so you have a coin that's back and forth. There's a kind of a meltdown value where you know. Somebody says that this coin is more interesting than the art that it's floating on. I don't know. Let's denigrate the work in any way. You know what um, I mean? Just like if you would prefer to have the ether tokens instead of the art <laughs> tokens. Work itself. Yeah. That's why I think they're on the right track. Yeah. Kind of stable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Because. Yeah, when all is going up, all is fine. But yeah. then, you know, if ether starts crashing, I don't think artists are going to be very happy about that. Yeah, absolutely. Wait, so let me get this straight. When you first launched, you you took people's artworks and you pegged it to the price of Ether directly? So it was simply every single price that was initially given in, say, April of 2017 when you launched, or 2018, I'm sorry, but now went through the, in the same sort of massive volatility and, and then decline? Or did you use Ether as the way people could pay and then and, and just left it at that? And then you had your own way of like pricing that that was its own stable thing? Oh, uh, yeah, so our users of the platform set their own prices, they just have happen to set the price in Ether. So if you set the price at one Ether and then the price crashed, you could just update your price to five Ether or something. Oh, okay, so it was up to the user to update according to inflation or uh, to volatility? Yeah, it's a it's a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace, so people set their own prices and they're in charge of the, the assets. And that per se defines that these artists are different artists, because I don't know one artist that we work with traditional artists that would even know about the volatility in either. So it, I feel like uh, we're, we're entering a world where we're, we're bringing on, we, we talked about this like a little bit earlier, right? Like the artists that are in this digital marketplace, they are kind of like different profiles. They're not the traditional painters that are gonna be in their studios and you know, working on the process over and over again, which actually builds uh, a ton of value for the world because it creates more, uh, quantity and it creates more diversity and it creates different projects which could never be executed in uh, the old analog world. So in, in your opinion, uh, where do you think this is going? In New York what? In your opinion, where do you think this movement is going? Honestly, I was trying to think of... Uh, I'm thinking about how resources are being redistributed in different ways, and we're inching towards a model. We're using these tools such as capitalism, and we, we think that it's just this one way. Capitalism is like, it's because it's a hammer, we think of it as like this, this tool that's caused great disruption, which it out and historically has. And when I'm thinking about this, you know, I'm still stuck on the, the creation of a scarcity model, and why we would want to make anything scarce, and why we are, have, have lived in this, in this mindset that is derived, you know, enormous benefit for only certain people out of making making scarcity a part of the model, right? I was I, I don't know if you're familiar with Mike Daisy's work. He's a monologuist. Um, he came from Seattle, which is where I lived for many years before New York, so I got to know his work, but it was still very young in incubation. And he's an excellent speaker. He's done a wonderful pieces. I can't recommend him enough. He's also a Brooklynite now. But he recently just did a 30-night consecutive piece um, every night for two hours doing another talk on a different piece of the history, the people's history of the United States. Starting with the very beginning of like the ships coming on and the kind of, and the, 
the creation of terrorism that really started here with the complete and utter genocide of the indigenous people, then brought you, of course, through the enslavement of another group of people, right? So the things that were truly of the people's history of our founding blocks. And one of the things that he talked about in that first encounter that still sticks with me, which I think that we're kind of coming upon at a meta level, we're coming back to, hopefully, um, is that there, there, were, there were clearly tiers of, of who had what, of, of who was well off, of who was not. Um, there was even, I think, on the boat that Christopher Columbus was, was pioneering across the, ship, the ocean, there was this um, contest that the first person to see land would get like some incredible amount of, of money from the queen every year until they died, which is so cool, right? And this one dude who we never have heard about was actually doing the, the early morning shift and saw it and said, oh my gosh, I see land, and he apparently was farsighted or whatever, and they went that direction, and of course, then Christopher Columbus wakes up and says, I saw that last night, I already knew. And he just took the money, went back and told the queen that, and the guy that, that first was you know, in like somebody's journal had actually seen it, the worker, was just didn't get brought into that. So this idea of, of scarcity and who and in and, and in in inequality in inequality and distribution of resources is already inherent in just who even saw North America first. But then we get there and the indigenous people, they didn't have poverty. They weren't there wasn't a thing where some people had more than others, right? They'd taken care of that part. They didn't have like say written language, but they didn't but they were like fine. They were like, here we have beautiful birds, do you want to try them out? Here you go. And like of course Christopher Columbus, as we all know, was like, they're so docile they'd make great slaves. Right? So like, totally different mindsets. One based on scarcity and commodification even of our own species, the other one based on a complete utility point model, really, like a membership, right? We're all members and we all get it and we all share in it. So as I see now this YouTube utility movement going where you only do well if everybody likes your stuff, if it's viral, right? Viral in a good sense now, not in a bad one. We maybe are coming back to something that's a greater redistribution and a model that, that perpetuates redistribution as the way of having value versus the constriction and the creation. I mean, when I think about like the historic, the most historic museums, they're all things that were that were stolen from other places and put somewhere for people to look at, like objects in a, like a, animals in a zoo, right? It's still a commodification of, of objects um, and of even people and even animals and all the things in the world, the internet of things and the reality of things all being only good if and valuable if there's not many and only a few people can see them because then you feel special, rather than this this engagement viewership model that we've just begun to, be, to, to make, and now we're just beginning to create direct value systems, tokens around it, we might be kind of hopefully coming back to a, a place where we finally see the value truly being created by the ability to share best, not by the ability to constrict. So I know this might be several steps past even where you guys are, the models that you're making and the companies that you're making and the, and the wonderful benefits that can be given to artists now, but I think in the long, long, long term, we're actually onto something much more interesting and exciting than finding ways of making scarcity. I think we should be looking for ways of making abundance. I wish I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> they recorded it. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I read up on your on your project and on your platform, and I would love to understand how the platform actually works and how it is it that you're able to connect cross, pla cross platforms and uh, can you provide a little more clarity on how this brings more transparency specifically for the art space? Okay, uh, which platform are you uh, referring to specifically? Because I've developed a few of them. Are you talking about the art sales platform? Well, on your bio it just said that you were linking up cross-border, uh, cross-platform technology. And that for me has right. always been a massive issue because every platform has its own unique language code, etc. So how do you make that a more general thing? Oh, I can speak to that as well with them. I found that one. Well, if I if I got the question right, the um, you know part of part of my experience was I was a surface warfare specialist in the Navy, and uh, on ships you have massive systems working together. A lot of systems interrelating together, and maybe they don't directly connect, but they still influence each other on, on some form. And so, uh, the, some of the platforms that I've been working with have to do with consciousness, quantum mechanics, and the way that uh, I think the most important thing is stay process oriented. 
stay process oriented by keeping the customer in mind and um, build the processes around that, uh, build the, the different uh, technologies around that. And for me, it's, a, it's, a, it's about the experience. It's, for art, one of the, I, I found that people, when people chase money in the art, they, it usually runs away from them. And by sticking with the experience of it and building around that, um, that is, that's the process I've been following. And uh, for specifically, I mean, what we're, what we're pulling out, uh, what we're rolling out right now, hopefully it'll be up by the end of the year, is a platform that uh, people will be able to experience art. And on the back side, on the business side of it, we'll have various technologies. I don't know if this is, I think you would kind of have to see it to, uh, to understand it fully. So that will, that'll be out uh, hopefully at the end of the year. But uh, we'll have some processes that will be just focused on the experiential, the artists, like what people will see with the art. And then separate but dovetailed, the back-end processes, some of which will be uh, quantum-based technologies, will be serving um, the delivery and sort of the business side, for example, one of the things I want to see is in the art business, if a gallery sells a work of art, sometimes it might take weeks or months before the artist actually gets paid. And so the gallery is holding on to all this money. And what I would like to see is the moment you know the deal is done, the artist gets paid instantly. And that's, what, that's kind of what I mean by sticking to the process instead of building the process around the technologies. Does that answer your question at all? Yeah, yeah, it kind of does. I think, you know, in terms of a high-level model, it's, it's, it makes sense. Uh, the, the biggest issue, I guess, for, for us that are building is deciding on a language, and once you do go for that language, like I would love to learn about how you certify using Ether, what is the, the process there, is it an easy integration, could any artist try to do that with their work itself because what we found is there's a lot of technological debt. Once you choose a, a path, it's very hard for you to come back and then say, oh no, I don't want to build one either, I want to build an EOS. Because you've spent so much time and so many resources to do that. And either the EOS pivot should not be that difficult if you have the right developers. I'm happy to introduce you to people, but the EOS platform I think is, is intentionally one of the best ones that you could pivot off of either for. That's one of the Ethereum for. That's why they are trying to capitalize on it here at the so I'm happy to introduce you if you like. Sure, we'll talk about that later. So can you tell us about uh, certifying on Ether? Yeah, sure. So um, it, it's actually very straightforward. Um, it's uh, you know using non-fungible tokens. So basically, uh, you can issue an NFT you know, for whatever you like. In our case, artists issue their own on the platform, and it represents a piece of art. Um, and yeah, it's for, for us because you know where we made a bet building on uh, Ethereum. I think the developer tooling was just easier, but uh, the way we structured the API is sort of agnostic. So I think um, down the road we'll see, you know, what makes the most sense. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so you think it's a, the two of you think that actually the shifts are very simple. Um, I think that. Being a founder and being a person who's in charge of stewarding a vision and founding a company and being in the CEO position, such as you and such as me, I think all of us, um, we all bring different strengths. And so if you're not a technical founder or you don't have a really strong technical background, that part of it can seem more difficult, which of course the rest of the team has to adjust for. But if it does happen to fall in your wheelhouse, sometimes you also maybe lose being a great CFO or something else or a great public speaker, whatever it could be. But yes, I do think that with the right um, rounded out team, those those issues are not hard to surmount. And I, I do have some experience in um, looking at interoperability because in real estate, there are, there are, this is not, what I'm doing in real estate is not a super brainiac thing to do. It's securitizing something. It's formalized fractional ownership. Maybe it's happening in the arts as well with fine art, right? Formalized fractional ownership of like really expensive pieces so you get a piece of it the next time it sells, you get a dividend and blah, 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 great. But, um, but interoperability is the next forefront of all, of all new technology, and blockchain is the first in that sense. 
So when people are building, they're jumping on Ethereum, and then they're saying that that costs gas every time that it's done. And why would you have something cost if you can go on EOS and it doesn't cost as much? Or if you want to use, um, I've decided on the Kadena network. They're actually a wonderful startup company that was uh, founded by the two people that started the JP Morgan Chase blockchain initiative four years ago, but no one was talking about that in FinTech. It was very, very secretive. They started that for JP Morgan Chase and then left them to start their own company, Kadena, because they saw that interoperability was a huge issue, but also not just on the coin level, but all the way up. So in having human readable contracts is a really big part of this, because in, with all new technology, think about when the first internet, the first wave of it came, right? What got everybody onto the internet? CDs, AOL did that. AOL gave you a, a piece of technology, and many of you may have probably no idea what the 90s were like, and I'm totally dating myself, but, we had these things called CDs, and people got them. You couldn't swing an egg cat without picking one up for free. You know, first it was like a dollar, then they were like, no, let's just give them away. Because you take the, the technology that you know, and you, you do what you know to do with it, you put it into the drive, and then suddenly it brings you onto the internet, and you get to pick out an email address. And now, welcome to the World Wide Web. And so now we are looking for those ways, whether it's through art or whatever, we need the interface to bring people easily from the existing technology they understand. And I think, it, honestly, I think it's the smartphone. It's the right apps and dApps, distributed apps, that will bring people into the blockchain world and the place where they can start earning money and spending new money and using new money. Digital money is just one AOL CD equivalent away from being totally massively adopted rather than just having a 3% or less, 0.3% adoption rate in the US like it does now. So we just have an interface issue, but we're close, and interoperability is a big part of that. If the technologists like ourselves can solve that, or the technologists like the people on our teams, I think that that's the background issue. The forefront issue is being able to talk about it easily, is having the right interface, and that's where artists come in, creative class people come in, to visualize that and make it easy to hit and plug and play. Yeah, and with that, that actually connects perfectly to my next question for you, Patrick. How do you see that uh, synapse between, between just pure creativity and creation to technology? Um, sure, it's, uh, yeah, I, I think with, with, with digital media, we, we should have the same sense that, that um, it's a, as fluid as, as a liquid media. And um, I think that we're finally reaching, let's say, like kind of peak art store saturation in cities where you know, it sends an amazing amount of, of, of materials and, and also garbage that's being produced by schools. I mean, about canvases and like heavy metal cadmium paints that are just ending up in the landfill is kind of insane. And so, if, if we're thinking about about how art inter interacts with the world, or how it's kind of helping create a better world, I think we need to get away from some of these retrograde ideas about about art and materials and materiality and, and old notions about value uh, and, and start to, to just question that a little bit more and, and think about what we're doing with our time and, um, and resources and, uh, and, and, and how um, you know, digital media is, is, a, is a great way of having that same fluidity and, and transferability without um, you know, an all 21st century media and that. Not always going to try to peg it back to something they knew from before, but introduce new value systems. Perfect. I think with that, we can probably open for questions. Oh, I also wanted to make a small plug uh, for a company that could use some blockchain help if anyone's interested. Um, it's, it's called WaltersCube.com. It's a VR uh, based uh, art gallery. Uh, which uh, they're digitizing exhibitions and publishing uh, art shows on the web. So, um, for instance, like we're about to scan the Andy Warhol show at the Whitney, um, and uh, so anyone can go visit that show, and it'll be virtually um, available in the future. And so it's, it's an it's an archive, and it's a resource for scholars. It's a it's, it's a uh, accessibility for people, um, and and in, and now it's really. I've also been involved in VR since the 90s, just to date myself again. But, um, and, and the technology really wasn't there, but you can see that like art or that asymptotic kind of curve. I think we're still in that kind of flat part of our blockchain, yeah. but it's so exciting because like at some point it's just gonna go whoop, 
and then we'll just take it for granted, like, you, you know, and, and we'll, we'll laugh about conversations like this and technology like that. Yeah, I love talking to you. We're doing a lot of experimentation with VR, so it's That's good. Okay. Uh, Leo, can you hear me? Yes. Um, Mike, well, thanks for coming. Thanks for being here and being patient with us. Um, the question I want to ask, um, you were talking about tracking the intellectual property of an artist. Like, you know, you go to the Louvre, you see Wing Victory of Summer Trace is stolen, Venus de Milo, and of course the great Mona Lisa, right? Um, is there going to be any sort of initiative that, uh, that people who have made great art that got it taken away from them to sort of bring it back to the original owners or the, or the original owner's family? And going forward, um, the art that's been made that can be perpetually tracked, is there going to be any sort of um, settlement if, if it gets stolen, like if you got insurance and stuff like that? Like what can the platform do to make sure that the, the continuity of the ownership remains with the people, the family, or who they're, who they're you know, or the person who created the original, uh, cont the original art? Okay, uh, I, heard, I heard a couple of questions there. One was uh, tracking ownership if, if it gets lost and, uh, and just maintaining long-term uh, uh, tracking what it is. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay, so that's actually uh, uh, about, I'd say about 2012, I kind of dedicated my life to a particular part of um, the arts, and that was what was, I found really interesting was how do art movements happen? And, and so I started exploring that uh, pretty deeply, which led me into consciousness studies and how our collective consciousness works. So the platform we're actually launching, it's an encapsulated platform. And uh, I would say that it's definitely not a panacea to answer all questions or to serve everybody. It's not, it, only certain people will probably gravitate towards it. And I think, um, the uh, tracking of the ownership, I, I don't know, the, the only thing that uh, I'll be involved in specifically is the art that we're selling. And uh, from that, I would say we want to have be a full service, complete service. There's generally three reasons people sell art, that's death, divorce, and taxes. And so we want to have basically services for each of those reasons why people sell art while simultaneously providing just a, an ironclad history of every single work. So to answer your question about returning, returning art that's been stolen, I think what blockchain will allow us to do is basically eliminate that possibility from the, stealing art is not a good idea because it's not virtually impossible to resell. You know, the only reason people generally do it is to keep it for themselves. And so uh, I think having a, a, you know, will provide us, but it's really going to be how a, a community, how the art community in general approaches this. And it's probably not going to be one answer, but a lot of different groups providing their own particular answer for that. And uh, just I'll also... Uh, I don't, I don't know, I can't get into the specifics, but I have figured out a way to use uh, components of blockchain as a form of AI in tandem with quantum computers that will allow us to track art movements and, uh, how, and be able to find out, you know, tracking influence, I guess you could say. And uh, I don't know, did that answer your question at least partially? Absolutely, thank you so much. Okay. Uh, art is really a physical medium, and the new technologies have basically devolved art into distribution of imagery. The components that you actually mentioned about scanning the Warhol exhibition is that with uh, uh, like photogrammetry and trying to obtain some type of physicality of the art. I mean, that's one question, but I just find the whole concept that art has been reduced to the image just totally negates the whole concept of standing in front of a mural that's 20 feet by 8 feet, and if it's a fresh painting, you smell it. If it's a piece of sculpture, you can feel it if you're 
kind of break museum rules. But, uh, you know, there's a whole different aspect of art. And it's, it's kind of, I don't mind the aspect of fandom. You know, I'm a fan of Warhol and I'll have his pictures and I do, you know, have a whole collection of things. But what is happening, I mean, what do you see the future of the physicality of artwork and how can that be restored? Can I get to just yeah, make it. one comment? Because that's actually why we built our company as we did, because we looked at real pieces of art and said, real pieces of art are always going to be masterpieces. They're always going to be there. They're always going to be present. And they're so important. The experience of going to a museum is not going to end. The experience of collecting uh, unique works is not going to end. But as we mentioned before, and I think you touched on this, prints are, are kind of like a separate layer of collecting. Maybe it's like the collecting beginner level, or it's when you start liking an artist. But at the same time, implementing that concept of digital scarcity, even if it is an image in a re reproduction, makes it a piece of art, and makes it a valuable piece of art, which can gain value as that same artist gains value. But I don't think the imagery, or the prints themselves, or whatever you want to call them, or the posters, or taking away from the masterpieces or from the unique pieces. I think they're building, actually. Um, I, I can't help but think of this in terms, sociologically, but about, about privilege, right? Because I would be, I've been enormously privileged to stand in front of paintings that are, you know, freshly painted and I smell them and I get this additional sensory experience. And those of us who love it, we take our opportunities to indulge in this and to have this. This is a resource that is available to us to a degree. But of course, we're looking at like decreased numbers of people going to, to museums anymore, right? And increased numbers of online classes. So everything is becoming digitized and more available. And those who can have the physical real thing are the privileged ones, right? There's going to be people watching these this through a video stream that didn't get to be in the room. That might not be a big differential of privilege in this particular scenario, but it's a huge one in those scenarios that you point out, like with real artwork. And you're trying to bridge that gap by thinking about the actual tangible object, but also in digitizing it to increase engagement and opportunity. So I can't help but look at it through the lens of, of privilege and that we, we would hope that having greater circulation of, say, an image like the Mona Lisa can only inspire more um, viewership in person if people decide to put their money towards it, and Paris holds on to that in the Louvre for that reason, right? Because they want that, that those people to take that opportunity. But it still doesn't mean we're robbed of being able to see it. So I think that you know both both sides of that are, are accurate. It's just that the, that the landscape is shifting. That more and more times it may be that as we are able to digitize or, de or democratize or technologize more of our experiences through VR, AR, through maybe even who knows if we'll someday have an app for smelling things, you know. But if that's possible, then we are reducing how what a privilege it is to have certain things and increasing how the opportunities to fully engage them as best we can. So this is a new means, I think, for for distribution, not just for separation of, of the real thing versus the not real thing. Hopefully they can be more bridged. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, we're really building tools for digital artists. I don't think just because they produce their work digitally, it takes away from physical work. I think if you make something that you know speaks to you in Photoshop and it speaks to me, it doesn't take away from like if it was in reality, like here with us, and there's a physical version. I don't think that one's better than the digital one. I think it's just uh, sort of expanding the scope. You know, um, for us, like a lot of people on the platform, I think these artists. Were, are not really you know, taken seriously by galleries, they wouldn't have representation, and now they have an outlet where you know somebody can pay $100 for something that speaks to them. So I think it's interesting, and it's sort of just broadening the scope, and I think it probably will just, or my hope is anyway, that it brings more interest to the arts and makes it a little more accessible, and then people feel like, oh, this was fun and an easy thing to do. Maybe I will go to the museum today, because I'm thinking about more art and stuff like that, so I think that's the way we're thinking about it anyway. I mean, there is the digital original. I mean, I work in digital technologies, and it is purely uh, non-physical until I print it or make the decisions about it, whether it be AR, VR, you know, animation, video. Those things don't have the same physicality of a large painting or a large piece of sculpture. But there is a lot of student artwork out there that not every piece that is physical is a masterpiece.
That's yeah. true. Yeah. And but to, to answer the, the question you mentioned, um, Walter's cube. Are you uh, photogrammatizing it or just photographing it? Um, well, the algorithm is is, um, is basically stitching. It's a high end version of stitching uh, photos of the space. Uh, so there's a there's a technique of how to document the space and the objects in the space, and um, and then that's stitched together, uh, and it it looks uh, pretty real. So. Um, the, the, the name comes from Walter Benjamin's theory of the shadow uh, because when something feels real, uh, it, it, there's a, uh, the way light moves on surfaces and, and the way we see shadows helps us understand reality. Um, and, and, and this technology has rendered that photographic reality in a, in a very convincing way where you can still navigate the space more or less organically, and um, and when you're using, you know, you can have it on your phone and you pinch it and poke your way through it, or it's a first-person shooter kind of controls as well. Um, but uh, if you just put it in a cardboard headset, you're looking around and you can have a, a, a very real experience because because photographically, um, we're, we're you know we're looking at something that that, that feels right. To, feels like a, a real space. Um, so I think you, you, you can have those sublime moments in, in a space like that. You just, you, you suspend the disbelief for a second and, um, and then you're communing with the art object. And, uh, and, and that's uh, the same thing happening. And, and, and again, just to, to, to push on that democratizing of art thing, um, it's giving allowing people to have that access and exposure and uh, to, to 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 shows all over the world is is, is part of the, the, the project and and then also to encourage people to to accept work in a, in a digital space thinking that okay why why does, why does this work have to be produced uh, you know in some kind of analog way like as an artist I like I have, just, I have a piece in the museum in Detroit right now and and I I, I could email it in. So and I, I, I do that, and, and uh, I have a piece reproduced in China. Um, I thought, oh, this is great, like maybe somebody will actually knock it off, and then, you know, <laughs> it, it, it should be in China for free, that'd be awesome. Um, and, but it was, in a, it was in a blue chip gallery, and they, they, you know, they took care of it. And, and, and after we said, okay, we'll either we'll sell it, or we'll destroy it, or I'll give it as a gift. And, and then those were the, were the options. Um, and, and so uh, I think there's a, a lot of exciting potential there when, when people uh, make digital work, uh, output it as, as necessary, um, but think of the output as the, as the way it, it uh, exists in the world, um, but that is first and foremost a real digital object and to have, respect it that way. Maybe that Blue Chip uh, Museum could have given you a fourth, op fourth option, which is like sell it as one, destroy it or gift it or securitize it and let the crowd Fractionally of it, and they'll see their collection. That would have been that would have been vast, right? I'm here to help. <laughs> She's actually there, y'all. Yeah, great. Yeah, I have mixed opinions about securitizing one piece and a bunch of people. But you know, we can go into that afterwards. Yeah, sure. Uh, hi. Um, the, the greatest artists in history are often not very popular at their times. Uh, I wonder, is there, um, as exciting as it is connect, to connect artists to consumers with blockchain technologies, I wonder, is there room in the, the ecosystem to support artists who might be too ahead of their times? Tell me about it. <laughs> it kind of makes me think about the, um, what is it, the lending, there's been like a lending initiative for uh, MBA students at Columbia, where Finally, you know, some, it's all finance up there, right? So they're like, wait a minute, we see a lot of future earning potential and a lot of secure lending options now, but they're all broke MBA students. So if you're an MBA program in Columbia, you can qualify for more lending than if you're, say, in an MFA program, because we don't see that you're going to have great future returns. But so it, it's, I can, I, it makes me think about that when you look at kind of a group and you say, in the future, we can see 
a likelihood of, of better returns and of greater risk now, but in context of where you're going in the large canon of your, of your career, you're going to be more secure than you seem right now with your credit score and your debt-to-income ratio. But I think it's very difficult to be predicting cultural uh, determinations because it's such a moving target. You know, it's much more difficult, and un unfortunately now, to be able to say, you know, let's look at the type of work they're making and how relevant it's going to be and how well it can be consumed maybe in a few years. That's quite difficult because it's not up to, to just looking at the nuts and bolts of the likelihood they'll get a high paying job, the likelihood they're gonna have a really great degree that will determine that high paying job. So it's just, I think by the mere fact that it's such a meandering path to be an artist, it's really hard to do predictive measures like that. I would say that watching could be very helpful for establishing uh, a, 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 like a value chain of, of conceptualization and, and as a means of, of kind of a real time um, uh, copywriting of, yeah. of concepts, right? Um, it, it, what, 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 the first thing that came to mind was was the very kind of uh, real world meets digital world uh, example of the scanning of the Jackson Pollock uh, masterpieces. Um, people were kind of in agreement that this was interesting work, um, despite the way it was was initially promoted. Um, but somebody eventually scanned that work. And they said, this is one of the most complex algorithms in, in the history of image making. And, and so when the technology came around to look at the work um, through that lens, the, the value was, was underscored by, by the fact that uh, a, a computer could help us understand this thing in a, in a qualitative way. So I would say you know, create some kind of portfolio mechanism for yourself on the blockchain that, that seems like it's going to be stable um, one, one of the problems is, is, is that in the art community, no one's really sure what's sticking around. Right? You know? and, and the people who've, who've been through the various dot busts, um, we're not really motivated just yet to, to invest heavily in you know, uploading things because, uh, because the upside is not so clear. Right? And also, you know, art, art is already kind of a, a volunteer hypothetical economy. Um, and, and so doing more labor is, uh, futurity is, is already a lot, but, but, I, but I would say for, for artists uh, to, to kind of figure out a system by which they record their ideas and, and share those ideas and then hopefully the credit will come around as it's due. Great. One last question.
Well, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, panelists. This was great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.